real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Nearly 20 people are physically abused every minute in the U.S., creating more than 10 million victims every year. Human trafficking is a global epidemic with an estimated 27.6 million victims at any given time. Corrupt and ineffective systems do not hold perpetrators accountable and fail to provide help to get millions of survivors safe. Now is the time to stand up and speak out. At Humanity Against Violence, we are uniting survivors, organizations, and communities to create change. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Our videos are for information purposes only and any accusations are alleged and less found guilty in a court of law. Let the show begin. I'm ready when you're ready, girl. All right. Start with telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you have going on. I guess I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. You know, um, I've this last four years has been pretty um, intense, I guess you could say. I've been dealing with the uh, judicial system, the law enforcement system, child services systems. Uh, but all of that started from, um, you know, obese me and my kids went through. Um, and I guess it was probably around 2017 that I met my daughter's father. You know, it's, it's a funny thing because I remember when my sister, years back, uh, she was in an abusive relationship. And... You know, I, I would tell my mom, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, why does she not just leave him? Like, just leave. Why is she putting up with that? You know, and I just thought it was the most ridiculous thing. I, I couldn't even fathom it. And um, I remember one time I had uh, driven down to pick her up and, you know, she was all busted up. And I thought, well, like my brother even wrote her off for a while, maybe like three or four years. He was like, I, I just can't do it anymore. Like, I can't put myself through it. I can't put my family through it. And, uh, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at on this note is that, you know, I never, I had, before that I was married, I was married for 10 years. He was my best friend. Um, we were young and dumb, thought there was bigger, better things out there, you know? And, uh, so when I left, I guess you could say that I was just very naive to, um, I'd never met a narcissist. I'll tell you that. Uh, and not in real life before that point. And so I had no idea. Um, that a human being was capable of being that just downright ugly. Um, on a whole new level. <laughs> it does. Because in your heart, you believe, okay, so if I'm kind to this person, you know, this person's been damaged. This is like, so in my head, I'm very empathetic towards other people. And I feel like that, um, and I think that it's probably been pretty well proven that, you know, that's exactly the target for a narcissist. So, uh, I feel like a lot of us that have went through this kind of thing um, probably have that in common, that we're empathetic. And so that the first time something really wild and crazy happens, like, for instance, for me, um, you know, I had no sign or clue that uh, he was the kind of person that would do some of the things that he did until uh, about two weeks after my daughter was born, you know. And uh, we had went, can I speak freely? Because, like, you know, we're all grown ups. There's a lot of different yeah, things involved sure. with all this stuff. But um, so we, he and I had went out to uh, karaoke. He said he wanted to take me on a date. He's like, well, you know, you've been pregnant all this time. We haven't done anything in a while. So, okay, well, let's go. So we go to karaoke and he starts trying to do like, um, let's, I, I don't know, trying to, kind of coerced me into a situation with him and the bartender that I was not comfortable with. And I'm like, um, I've never been in this kind of situation with him before. I don't know where it's coming from. I'm also not a confrontational person. So, you know, I walked outside and uh, sat in the car and then he came and fired me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm drinking. I, you know, so he talked me into coming back in and then 
you know, similar things happened when I was back in. So I just told him, look, I'm going outside to sit in the car. Now, at this point in our relationship, like I said, it's two weeks into my relationship. Like I, I had no idea. Like I, um, I thought he was a great guy. You know, he told me before I even get into that, I'll tell you another thing that I wonder if this is a common thread or not. But, you know, whenever I first met him, I had two boys and uh, their father wasn't in their lives. And he was, oh, I always wanted to adopt two boys. Like this magic number two, like I always wanted to adopt two boys. And I thought, well, isn't that great? You know, that's pretty cool. And then, you know, he kind of picked up on all my things and he was like, well, he runs a, um, he told me he runs a nonprofit for um, underprivileged kids in the inner city of New Orleans to teach them woodworking so they could learn a skill and have a trade. You know, all these things, they were lies. None of it was real. None of it was real. So anyways, I believe two manipulators. Yeah. You know what lies and they have the the grandiose yeah. ideas and scheme. Yeah. Look things. at all this great. I am so great. I am and I'm everything you want. I think that's one of the most um crazy things. It's like, how do you not see it coming from a mile away? Because when you look back, you can think, okay, nobody's that perfect. You know? Right. But in the middle of the situation, it's like you don't see it. It's just like, oh, well, this person is the person I've been waiting for, you know? And uh, so I just remember now looking back, I think, man, I was so dumb. But, you know, then I was so dumb. I just didn't, you know, I didn't see it coming. And uh, anyway, so fast forward back now, um, we, you know, at the karaoke bar and he and I, I, I've already went and sat in the car. And so he gets really irritated, I guess. But at this point, I still don't even know he's irritated. He gets in the car. Now we are about, 40 minutes outside of New Orleans. So we have to go back on the big interstate and all this stuff. Well, he comes to get in the car and I could tell that like he didn't feel right. By the time we put out the driveway and got onto the highway, he just started slapping me. I'm talking about hard, repetitively while he's driving. And I'm like freaking out because I wasn't expecting it. Okay. It came from nowhere. I had no idea that he was abusive. Um, I didn't even see a sign that he would be abusive, you know, and this was um, a little while into our relationship. So you would think it, you think, you know, a person at least, you know, yeah. um, but it's, it's shocking how, how many people have this kind of same story. It's like, it just, when it hits, it's like from nowhere and um, didn't expect it. But so I'm like apologizing because he, he keeps telling me, you, you embarrassed us. You embarrassed us. Like, I don't even know what he's talking about, but I'm just like crying saying, I'm sorry, because somebody just started slapping the crap out of me from nowhere. Right. And so anyways, um, by the time we got off the exit uh, ramp to go in towards Hammond, there's a little, um, underneath a bridge back there, it's like pitch black. No one ever passes barely. A couple cars a night, it's right down by the bayou. Um, he pulled over the truck on the side of the road, um, made me get out of the, out of the truck. I didn't even know he owned a shotgun. And this is the very first time anything crazy happened, you know? And, uh, he makes me get out of the truck. He makes me sit down on the side of the road, you know, and he gets the shotgun out of the, behind the seat. And, um, you know, he, he, he's assaulting me and popping the fire, shot going off over my shoulder and stuff. You know, he kept me there for hours. Um, anytime someone would, uh, their headlights were coming, you know, he would put the shotgun to my head and tell me not to move. And, you know, this was, this went on for hours. It was super, super, um, unexpected. I think that, that part of it, made it a little more for me more traumatizing because it was just like it came from nowhere or, you know it's just a um, terrifying experience it and is a terrifying experience absolutely and especially he was drunk so in my head i kept thinking like this is it i'm gonna die on the side of this road he's gonna leave me here and they maybe they'll find me after the birds eat my eyeballs out or something i don't know you know but those are the kind of things you're thinking in your head and it's terrifying it's, it's really um, hard to explain the feeling of, you know, being afraid for your life at the hand yes. of the person that you love. Yes. And especially, okay, so 
there's some period of time from that very first instance to, you can literally see it in my journals. One day, whenever all this fighting that I'm doing is done, I'm going to make some kind of book of healing for people who are going through this kind of thing. But so I am uh, a writer. I love to write. I write music. I write books. I write, well, I used to, I don't have time anymore, but uh, I write all kinds of things. And one thing I've always done is journal. And so as I was going back through some of the evidence and things as I'm trying to get ready for court and do some of the things that I had to do whenever I filed a protection order, um, you know, I made myself kind of step outside of myself and read those journals uh, from not my per- perspective, you know, just like kind of like bird's eye view. Yeah. And the one thing that I noticed was I went from, you know, and this is the thing that I guess I was getting about my sister. One thing that I noticed as I read those journals was that the very first one from the time of meeting him and then moving all the way through, I watched myself break. Um, you know, it, it gives me chill bumps when, to even talk about it because it's, 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 um, how could you, how could you let anyone do that to you? You know, and it's like, it's the same thing I would say about my sister. How can she let, how can you let a person do that to you? Just leave them. But it's a progression and you don't realize it's happening. So I'm going to get back to that progression part, uh, in a minute, but if, I could say that one thing that I feel is super important for anybody that watches this, that's um, maybe still going through whatever they're going through. Maybe they've only just now, maybe you're just now at the karaoke bar, you know? Um, Well, for that person, I would say like, get the hell out. (laughs) It's not going to change. That first time, you know, you want to make excuses. And so that's what I want to say. This is the deal. That situation was horrific. It was criminal. He could have spent 10 years in prison for it. Um, It was just a terrible thing to do to somebody. Um, But what I did was he had already taken me away from my family. See, so I was in Mississippi when I got pregnant. And about six months into my pregnancy, he kept, kept on and kept on. And he finally got me to move down to Louisiana, away from my family, my friends, and everyone. So I'm there. Don't know my buddy. Don't have no friends there. Don't want to call my mom. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, I'm not going to, so I, I love him. I don't want to call and tell my mom and dad or my sister, Hey, this happened. This person, you know, um, because then that locks you into a place that you can't come back out of. That's in your head. Cause in your head, you still haven't, you you're still trying to justify, like there has to be a reason. There's something that you're missing. It's because he was super drunk. Um, you know, I've known him things. for a year. This isn't it, him. This isn't him. Right. And so, so what I did is I called his uh, mother and I, I told her, I said, she was supposed to be coming to see my daughter uh, that weekend. And I asked her, could she come in early? I needed to talk to somebody. And so she did. And um, looking back on all this stuff, it's so crazy. But so she and I, we're sitting on the back porch of our house. Um, he was at work. He wasn't at home. Kids weren't around. So I'm just talking to her and I just flat out told her, I said, okay, so this is what happened. And I tell her what happened. And so immediately she just starts downplaying it. Like it's not, it's not a big deal. Um, that's probably cause you guys shouldn't be going out and drinking. I don't think probably going out drinking is not a good idea for you guys, you know? And like, Immediately, she starts saying all these things. Now, I'm already trying to make those excuses myself, okay? Right. And so, at that point, you're going to take any little bit of confirmation that you can get. It's like, okay, sure. this person says, it's just because we went out drinking. We shouldn't have went out drinking. Um, well, now, and I'll say this. I was married for 10 years, and we went to karaoke one time a week for 10 years, and we drank every time and he never put his hands on me okay so uh making excuses like while they were drinking while they were doing drugs whether they are under the influence whatever it is that is not an excuse you know i should that should have even been a bigger red flag that i could tell his mother okay 
this person committed aggravated assault with a firearm against me. And for her to just try and blame it on, well, we shouldn't have went out drinking. That should have been like, okay, what is going on? Because Why like, what kind of person... reaction, not shock. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. my son did that. Yeah. So, yeah. My mother would have, if, if he would have said, came to my parents and said that, my parents would have been like, what the heck is going on? Do you need to go be put somewhere? Are you on bad drugs? What is right. wrong? You know what I mean? Um, because I would never do anything like that anyways. But, but my point is, is I don't know if this is, and I always wonder this too. So in your situation, uh, did you know the parents well of, of the situation you were in? Um, you know, it, uh, it was a crazy situation uh, for my girls and I. His mom worked for law enforcement since she was the mm. age of 15. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was pointless. And, and I've heard this from multiple of his, of his victims. Um, his parents victimized his victims, same as he does. Um, they That's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. And um, like there was a time where the neighbor had called the police uh, because he was, you know, threatening to kill me and my whole family and everything yeah. else. And and uh, she saw them pull in because she lived in an upstairs apartment. And she immediately looked at me and said, I could tell you right now, if you open your mouth, it will not be my son that goes to jail, but somebody will be. And I'm well, like, well then <laughs> yeah you know, you know what that's a net that's that's the thing that i was wondering because which i have a whole lot to say about law enforcement on domestic violence too and you know that but we i, I won't spill it all right now but you're right and and unfortunately um whether there's a mom or or not so like that was extra terrible for you that there was a mother involved because it can happen like that even without um just out out of a bias but but yeah, so I was wondering that though, because I, I find that his mother would um, turn it around on me. You know, one constant fight we used to always have was he would try to put me in uh, sexual situations I didn't want to be in. And so I'm a hard headed person. You're, well, I'll tell you at the beginning of my relationship, I was a lot more hard headed. And then you can see this like gradual decomposition of who I am break you in down. my journals yes and um his mother lived on the same property as us so she had a home and we had a home on the same property well you know situations would happen that were just not okay like she's seen him pick me up by my throat and strangle me in the middle of the air she's seen him slam me in a car car door like over and over she's seen him drag, drag me across the pavement she's seen him put his fingers into the sockets in my eyes and like hold him and holler at me she's seen all that and uh you know she never says anything but you know i guess what really ticks me off about that part of it now is that i have a daughter with him and so my daughter is now suffering through that abuse and it's like if you were any sort of a grandmother you would not allow this you would put your foot down and say okay you might have got away with you know, um, just completely destroying her, but you are not destroying my grandbaby. You know, we could do but a whole don't. episode on my thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's a shame. It really is shameful, but, but yeah, so I guess what I think that is so important for people to realize at the very front of it, if you watch this and you are at that Point. We'll just say you're at the karaoke bar <laughs> that like just at the beginning you're you're at that very first instance of abuse or maybe you've been dealing with it for a month or so and you just whatever well or maybe you've been dealing with it a long time and you don't even realize what I'm about to say to you because I didn't realize it and so I went back and read my journals but when you go back and you read stuff and if you document well you'll notice that in the very beginning this person who built you up, because that's what abusers do. So when you first meet them, the reason why they're so charismatic, they're so amazing, they're everything you wanted, because A, they study people. <laughs> they study people and they victimize people. And so they have a very particular kind of victim that they choose usually. Um, and that person has uh, usually has certain kind of attributes and most always is very empathetic. But 
what they do is they convince you they're this great guy, they're everything you ever wanted, and then they make you feel amazing. It's like, oh, well, you know, um, you know, I'm terrible at the guitar, for instance, but I love to play. And I, but the reason why I play is so I can write, uh, write my own songs. But anyways, but you know, I was terrible, but he would just make it out like I was the best guitar player in the world. And I was just so beautiful. And I was just all these things and they build you up, build you up, build you up. Like, but then after that very first instance, they take everything away from you. Yes. And then all of a sudden you're like, I've done something really bad. My mom would always right? tell me to always be careful about anybody who puts you up on a pedestal. Yes. Because the higher they put you, the harder, the harder the you fall. fall. That's yeah. right. And so that that is one way though that uh that somebody that has it because I I always had a strong self esteem. I had a strong sense of self worth. I was nerdy and I didn't you know do my but but I never was. Um, affected by what anyone thought about me or that's who I've always been but something about the build up like you said when they tear it down and I look in the journals and I see myself and it's like there's part of me that's like I'm not tolerating this I'm gonna leave and there's part of me that's making excuses and even in my journal I'm doing it okay and so then I got to a place because he won't let me talk do you know so you know, someone's like that. They're not going to let you talk. They're uh, they'll say whatever they want. It doesn't have to be true. Um, if you try to talk, they're going to talk over you. Um, they'll, they'll tell you you're crazy for saying the truth. Um, gaslighting, you know, just all that. And so, eventually, I just started writing letters to him instead of my journal. So my journal went from my journal that I had always done to these letters. To this man that stole my voice you know yeah. and it's like it's sad it's heartbreaking to, to to know that i allowed someone to do that to me but you know i'd be arguing with him in my journal saying i am not going to do this i am not tolerating this i am not and then i would list all these names that he calls me i am not a bad mother I would never put my hands on you, my feet on you, my teeth on you. Do not hit me, kick me, bite me. Like, you know, all these things I'm saying in my journal and I like look back down and I'm reading them. It's like, who the hell was that girl? Because this girl, <laughs> this girl would have probably not done any kind of physical altercation in that first instant. But this girl now, she would have been safe until she got home and the moment his drunk behind went to sleep she would have put the kids in the car and been gone yeah but but there's this process when you don't understand how these things work in the beginning where they like like we said they build you up they tear you all the way down and then all your self-worth comes with whatever they'll give you like oh well yeah. today i'm going to be kind to you today today i'm going to tell you you're beautiful because i've told you you're worthless for three weeks and i and I know you're about to leave now. <laughs> like I can feel it. You're you about had enough. So today I'm going to build you up. And then that's how that cycle goes on and on. Yeah. And you believe the entire time, you know, this person's just damaged. No person could treat another person this way who's not just hurting. They, that's one thing I used to always say. He's good to me, uh, my kids. But we went through a lot in the beginning of all this because, you know, and dealing with him because I'm forced to deal with him, right? Because we have a child together. And he's like, he still has the control to completely just rip you apart in a 10 minute phone call. And you, you know, if my partner right now would not have told me, and we fought several nights, he's like, no, you've got to have boundaries. He is not, you know, he's not in charge. He's not in charge here. He's not in charge of you. Even if I wasn't with you, he's not in charge of you. Like, you know, but it took somebody building me back up. Thank God for him because, you know, it's devastating to go through it, something like that. It changes you. Yes, I mean, it does. From from one aspect to another. And there's mm -hmm. so much long-term damage that's done yeah. from the trauma, the PTSD. Yes. And yes. that's a lot to recover from. And how do you ever move forward without right. you know, having those memories and those fears. And right. I mean, it instills a lot into you. 
Right, yeah. And even the way you interact in a new relationship, you know, yeah. I see it, you know, I think the most heartbreaking part of this entire thing that I've been through as far as, and I'm not even going to go into all the, um, the things I've been through with the law enforcement or the judiciary, but just our, today, I just am going to talk about the things that we went through, through this abuse. But I think the hardest thing of everything at first, the thing that made me be able to leave, and then I'll say the hardest thing. Uh, was I went into my son's room and he was not doing well. Um, he'd always been a great kid, never been in any trouble. And, um, you know, he'd started smoking pot and just acting out. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on? So I was going in his room and I was going to search through the room and I was going to figure everything out. And I found a journal. And it was dated one of the days that was really bad. And he was there for it. And he used to draw. And he had, he had drawn a rose with all the petals fall, falling off of it. And it was a song he used to blast. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. But it said, uh, I, know all the, I know all the pieces fit because I saw them fall apart or something like that. And it said, I love you, mom, at the bottom. And I'm like, oh, hell no. But done. Oh, how hard work. So, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, um, that for me, it was like, enough, you know, and he had sent me a text message. He, like, he, he was like, mom, you, you're not even the same person anymore. Like, you don't even have any self-confidence. You let him just talk to you. and just He's like, why are you letting him do that to you? You know, and it's like, you don't realize it when it's happening. Because in your head, you believe that you're going to fix it. Because you're a fixer. And you're going to fix this. And you're going to fix him. And then when you're done fixing him, you're going to fix yourself from what he's done to you. And then everything's going to be okay, you know. Flash forward, I think the hardest thing from all this is... You know, I was saying that you learn your behavioral um, components for even new relationships and things by what you've been through, the trauma you've experienced, the walls that you've built up, the coping mechanisms that don't work anymore. And now you've like, you know, patched them and duct taped them and they're just a mess. And my daughter has been being abused by this guy and uh there's nothing i can do to save her i've been fighting for her for a long time i'm gonna keep fighting for her but um when she gets angry and she has a big outburst she doesn't want to be acting out but she wants me to come hug her yeah. but she is so afraid to be vulnerable five years old she's so afraid to be vulnerable that she won't do that and then whenever i come grab her and i hold her she'll just start crying you know and after we go through that part and this is like every night thing while she's with me and um after we get through that part of it uh you know she'll say mom i'm so sorry i don't know why because she'll say i hate you before we get to that place you know but it's like she has to, she's like projecting this big tough persona that's not real. And she won't let herself cry or, or anything like that. And, but the moment that I go grab her and she knows it's okay and she's safe, just like immediately, she just cries and cries. And then she'll say, I don't know why I act like that. I'm so sorry. I don't, you're you know, and it's like, like yeah. And so, and, and, and so I guess it's like, that's another thing I want to say uh, if anyone's watching this and they're going through things like the trauma that you, even if that person's not beating your child, because I'm going to tell you something, that's something that women, we do. It's like, okay, well, the kids don't know. And then the kids start knowing, like, you don't let yourself know they know. You think maybe they could know. And then there's things like that day where, you know, he drug me through the house by my hair in front of my kids and he's stomping me in my stomach in front of him. And he turns on my son and then he's another day, he grabbed my son and pinned him to the throat. And it's like, then you get to a place where it's like, okay, now there, they will abuse your kid. If they're abusing you, 
they will abuse your kid. Um, I don't remember the exact statistics, but I think it's like it, it's over fifty percent. It's I I, I want to say it's like some sixty some percent of uh, spousal abusers end up uh, abusing the children as well. Yeah, yeah, and and really and honestly, it's probably more. I'm telling you, any person that will flip out on you and get violent on you, a um, a grown adult. In the right given spot, they will do that to anyone. Absolutely. You know? Well, obviously, and, fully capable. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, and uh, you're either and abusive or you're not. There's not that's really right. a gray area with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, and the sad, unfortunate thing is, you know, you don't know until it happens. Like I, like I said, because someone like that, most of the time, they just cannot control their temper. So if you don't think that they can lose it on your child. You're wrong. And so convincing yourself of that and staying till they do, um, there's damage you can save your child from if you leave now. Even if your child's already been damaged, my children were damaged before I left. But I still save my children from some damage. But the I guess what I'm getting at is the sooner that you get out, the more trauma you save your child from. Because even if your child's not being abused, they are watching you, like my son, with that journal entry they're watching the person that they love more than anything in the world who is their safe place crumble to a place where they're not even safe for themselves or them Absolutely. because they're allowing someone to constantly repetitively um cause chaos and destruction all around yes. so you know, it's just Absolutely so important. A traumatic event for children as well. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of time they end up suffering PTSD from it. Yes, absolutely. Famously. You know, if you could go back and you could look, you know, outside of yourself that early in, you could change everything, but you can't, you, you know, but what you can do is try and get out there and do that once you get here. Once you get to a place where you're safe, like, you know, right now, me and you're safe. We're sitting here. We're talking about this. We don't have to worry about anyone coming in the room and strangling us to death because of it. Um, but when you get here, um, make yourself look back. That way you can understand well enough what happened so that you can share it with someone else who needs to hear it. The statistics tell you women are not safe. Children are not safe. <laughs> They're not. And, you know, um, most people don't believe something like that could happen until it slaps them in the face. And that's when it's like, holy crap. Like, I would have never thought. I Like I told you, I was married 10 years and uh, my husband was the best guy on the block. <laughs> you know, he, he drank a little bit too much on the weekends and drove me crazy with that. Uh, get sloppy. But on Friday and Saturday, but other than that. I, I never had a complaint out of him. Uh, he was a great to us and he worked hard and he never, I mean, he wouldn't even raise his voice at me. He never. So this was shocking for me uh, whenever I dealt with that because it, it came from nowhere. I wasn't expecting it. And, and I was alone, but most times you're going to be alone because that's what they do. They get you Absolutely. alone. They know how to manipulate the situation and absolutely like, I mean, that's one of the big things with abusers is, I mean, most people are, no, there's no way he's not like that. I've never seen him even get angry. And yeah, they have, I mean, they are master manipulators. They are mm -hmm. master liars. Most yes. are extremely charming. And yes. you know, you just, you don't know and it yeah. makes it that much harder when you come forward as a victim because then you're automatically from the get-go looked at as uh i don't know she's telling the truth tell the truth yes and, and then you bring in all the other crap that society just piles on and i mean that's it's a lot of horrific stories so i can see it why is. it's hard for you know your normal average everyday person who's never experienced this to be like no, there's no way that's happening. This has to be exaggerated. <laughs> but, you know, right. I mean, it's, it happens. It yeah, it does. And it happens a lot, um, a, a whole lot. You know, I told you earlier when I talked to you on the phone uh, about the, the stuff I wanted to talk about and maybe the next time we get together on here. But um, the numbers are insane. And not only are are the numbers insane, but the responses uh, from the community 
and the people who are supposed to protect uh, people who are in situations like that, um, it's beyond disappointing. I mean, honestly, it's disgusting is what it is. Um, you know, and, and that's another thing is that um, you go through everything you go through and you finally get the strength to leave. You call the cops. Well, guess what happened the first time I called the cops? I was arrested. <laughs> I didn't do anything Three wrong. Times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, there's something wrong there. And that's what, I, you know, you it happened to you. Okay. I was reading the thing that I was reading earlier. Uh, I'm from Louisiana guys, <laughs> but she kind of knows my background. I forget that, that, that I haven't said everything, but, um, or I'm dealing with this in Louisiana. I'm from Mississippi, but, um, you know, one of the things that they put in their report down there is like, why are we dealing with this problem? Why are we number five in the nation for w women murdered by men? And one of the things that the uh, guy said was, you know, it, sometimes it's more likely that the person that calls for help is going to go to jail than they're going to be helped, you know? Um, it, and it's true. You know, but those guys feel safe calling authorities for help when yes. they feel their life is in danger. Absolutely. And, you know, another thing that I find that I hate that is happening in the world right now is, uh, you know, everything is so divided by all these subcategories of like, I'm a person, I'm this color, I'm this race, I'm this gender, I'm this culture, I'm this religion, I'm this. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, we keep getting like further and further and further separated from each other. Yeah. Okay. But one thing that is unfortunate for women. So I'm not trying to like, um, I guess reemphasize that or anything like that, but I will say this women as a minority, especially, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of focus on women's equality and workplace, uh, you know, all these things in life. But it's like, that's like running before we even crawl. Because when the numbers for domestic violence situations that we're having in our country without any support from government, with the um, law enforcement who would arrest you for calling 911 as quick as they'll help you when they get there, mm -hmm. um, for, you know, women living in fear for their lives and can't even call law enforcement for help because they get arrested. Are you kidding me? So why are we worried about equality and pay? Let's worry about the most vulnerable among us just being oh, safe to call alive. Law right. <laughs> like, just being okay to call law enforcement and not being um, arrested as punishment or intimidation to silence someone. Um, that, you know, our constitutional rights as women in those situations, I will say this, not just domestic violence victims from where I'm dealing with. And I don't know if it's like this in every state, but I, um, I study the statistics. I dig in hard. I am trying to fight for change. I have located unconstitutional legislative framework in Louisiana that is very discriminatory towards uh, domestic violence victims. I do a lot of work trying to make a difference here. And I will tell you, that when you're living in a system that says, for instance, in the legislation, a victim of a violent crime, the defining factor should be on what kind of crime. Was there a weapon? Uh, how much injury was to the person? These are the things that should determine penalty. But when you have the same exact uh, aggravated assault charge and the determining factor on penalty for the offender is whether or not it was committed in a home setting or not. And if it was, it's only worth one to five years in prison. Whereas if it was committed against a stranger, it's worth 10. Okay. You've got issues, women and children, not just women. So this is not just a women issue in domestic violence situations and women and children who are victims of crime perpetrated by men, because I know several that these situations where they, the daughters are raped. Okay, it's not happening in a domestic situation, but it's a man perpetrated crime against a child. Okay, and those crimes in Louisiana, the rape kits go missing. I know two personally, two, where kids are being sent back in home with a person that is raping them and the rape kit goes missing. Okay, there's big issues. Every child, every woman, every man, every person has the right to be safe and secure in their person 
They have the right to due process of the law before losing their children. They have the right to, um, you know, not live in gender motivated violence. They have the right to those things. And so when you have a system that is re victimizing victims, you have a sick community because no one's healing. So you have alcoholism, you have, um, you know, substance abuse issues. People are medicating and not taking care of themselves. And, you know, all these things because they're in a very abusive situation. And then they call these people and they say, okay, I need help. Well, the guys show up and arrest them or they take their kids away. I've seen this happen a lot too. It's like this person can better supply for them. They make more money. Okay. But they're beating the crap out of them. They're beating the crap out of them or molesting them. And, and it's that better for them if there's money involved because they make more money. But what I'm getting at is the system is not set up anymore to protect um, vulnerable groups, domestic violence victims being one of those vulnerable groups. And, um, you know, it's just important that we all talk. Uh, we tell our stories, um, you know, and we fight and don't give up. And I want to say another thing to you. I was one of the people that was dealing with substance abuse issues coming out of what I was dealing with. And, um, you know, I got it together and I didn't think I could. And I did. I did, sister. So if I can do it, you can do it. Keep fighting. You will, you know, if the most sad thing of the whole situation is if there's someone in this kind of situation and they strip them of the children, then they take the reason. Do you know what I mean? Does that make right. sense? It's like they take their reason away and it's like, yeah. And then the poor child, if they're uh, put to a person that's abusing them, then they destroy the child too, you know? I mean, just um, the heartache is. Mm -hmm. Yes. People need to be able to heal. For you sure. know, and, and, and that's part of that is being able to uh, have support from, you know, there's lots of women who do not have family support. Those women need. Uh, social services. Those women need to be able to go to counseling without paying if they can't. They need to be able to go to um, substance abuse classes or whatever if they can't afford to pay for it. They need child care service so they can go to work. They need help. I mean, really, it's so sad, but I'm just happy. I'll tell you one thing that does is, is hopeful, um, which that little bit that I shared today is just like the tip of my story because I'll tell you, and it's the, like the same with you. Uh, the amount of abuse that one person can put you through is nothing compared to what an entire state can put you through. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, but as we all go through the things that we're going through, I felt for a while, I'm just like hopeless. And, you know, I've been isolating myself and just trying to fight this by myself, fighting motion, filing motions and doing this and doing that, filing complaints, just whatever I could. But recently, I've been talking to people like you and other people that have uh, survived through these type of things who are dealing with the same kind of issues as far as custody situations or court or, you know, uh, protection orders being dissolved, all the stuff that happens. And so what it is, is this. This is going to change. And the beautiful thing about it is, is that nobody's going to come in and save us. We're all like joining together to save each other. And that is a beautiful wow. thing. People are starting to talk. People are coming together and telling their stories. People are like, you are providing a platform for people to share their stories. People like me are digging into the research and fighting like crazy in the courtrooms. Everybody's doing something. And then people are linking up. And after so long of that, they have to address it. Absolutely. Because we're going to fight and we're going to keep fighting until we get to a place where we are safe and our kids are safe. You know, um, but yeah, so yeah, we got to do something. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just ridiculous if you don't feel safe and you feel like your life is in danger. Or, I mean, even worse, so your children, like, yeah, you should be able to call and get help yes. without yes. a bunch of nonsense and a bunch of drama. And I tell you, yes. you know, for me, um, I I was living in Tennessee. And I met him, you know, in Nashville. He had lived there for about a, a year before I met him. And not long after we got together, he uh, put me into a situation where I was quite literally forced to have to move to New Hampshire. 
And, you know, I'd never been to New Hampshire, much less know anybody there. My family is all, you know, in Ohio, all my friends and, and my, you know, home life was in Tennessee. Yeah. And it takes me all the way up there and you're just so isolated and you just feel so hopeless and so helpless. And, yes. in, you know, to go through the system and thinking, okay, I have to get safe. This guy yeah. is going to kill me. Yeah. I yeah. don't get safe. And then for you to have to, you know, you have to call a domestic violence shelter and then you yeah. have to get an attorney and then you have to file a protection order and then yeah. you have to go to the police to press charges. And then you and have that's to it, they'll even take them. That's yeah, if the police will yeah. take the charges. That's yeah. if they'll even take them. That's if, you know, they don't dissolve your abuse case without even allowing you due process to be heard in a courtroom. Yes, you're right. And it's shameful what they're doing. And they're, that's what happens. So, yes, it takes you all the way across state. I'll tell you, any time, which I won't, I don't think I'll ever be single again. But if I were, <laughs> if I met a guy who does not have any close friends to account for because he hops all over the place from state to state, huge red flag, but huge red flag. Like there's a reason why they do the, all that moving. They destroy things and then they move, <laughs> you know? My ex is uh, infamous for that. He took me across state lines and um, his most uh, recent two victims that he had, he took both of them across state lines as well. That's what they do. And, like, and you would think, you know, from a legal standpoint, I mean, that's, that's a serious felony. You can't transport a victim across state lines with the intention of secluding them, mm -hmm. isolating them, assaulting that's what they do. them, and just doing whatever they want. Like that's some serious issues. Yeah. And it's yeah. just brushed off like it's nothing. And, you know, the VAWA worked really hard at, at getting, you know, legislative branches to recognize the fact that when you're in a domestic violence situation, there are multiple felonies in most cases that are being yeah. committed. And this touches on what you were talking about, where, you know, it's absolutely true in, in a lot of cases where if it's labeled as domestic violence, oh, well, mm -hmm. it's not as bad then. And they don't have to worry about getting as much time. That's the same thing. Right. When in it actuality, is the same thing. it should be far more time because yes. there are multiple aspects yes. to it. Well, and then also there's children. This is the thing that blows my mind. It's like, yes. How can you allow this kind of thing, even on children in Louisiana, those laws don't just apply to dating partners. They apply to kids. So you're saying quite literally that if you are a domestic violence victim, which overwhelmingly are women and children, then your life only matters half as much because in that situation, the best results, the most justice you're going to get is half and maybe only 10% of what another person would get in that situation. And it's like the people who understand that's really happening. They are people who are very vulnerable and broken. Um, you know, there's lots of us working our way out of it. We're at all different stages, okay? But it's going to take us because women who've never been through that don't understand it or even know it's happening, I think. They don't I really know. don't. And Unless so I think there's a lot of focus on equal pay. They actually witnessed it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Happening to somebody right. else or maybe. But, but even then, I mean, it, you know, actually experiencing it, it's, I mean, it's one thing to know it happened, yeah. but man, it's horrifying. I we mean, need some women who yeah. have been through it fighting for women's rights yes. because otherwise we're going to keep fighting for things like equal pay. And that's great. We need those things. I'm not arguing that, but I am saying that to me, that's like running before you even crawl. It's like, I just we want to have, live long enough to be able to get equal. I, yeah, right. I just want to, so first, the first step is like, I just want to live long enough to get to a place where I can think about equal pay. And then the next part is, I just want to heal enough 
where my brain works well enough, where I'm deserving of equal pay. And then like, you know what I mean? All these things. And it's like, there's so many, um, and I guess that's what I'm getting at. Unless you're a victim of that particular kind of situation, it's not really anyone's fault. They just don't know it. But that's why it's so important when we go through things, no matter what you go through, it's important for you to be a voice for that cause when you come out of it, because there's still people in it. Do you know what I mean? There's still people lost in it. And, uh, and unfortunately we lose a lot of women uh, and children to domestic abuse every year, you know, and I don't even know why we call it domestic abuse. It's so aggravating. It's like, let's call it what it is. Like if somebody's putting a gun to somebody's head, like, why do we have to call that domestic aggravated assault? Why does that have to be domestic? Why, why do we have to distinguish based off of the victim and not the crime to me and not just to me? Cause I know my constitutional rights, that's against your right to equal protection under the law. That's against the 14th Amendment. It's not constitutional, and it should not be in any state legislature because the 14th Amendment does not allow it. Yeah. Uh, so the it's just... Servers need to be charged with every single crime they are committing. Yeah. If they're assaulting somebody, that's a charge. Yeah. If they're forcing sexual, you know, yeah, acts that's of a any kind, that's a separate charge. I and mean, there's charged. a lot of things that play into it and it Absolutely. needs to be charged accordingly. Yeah, it does. And, and I feel like too, whenever you create this, um, so it's not just about like, okay, like it's, it's bad enough that the, like the laws, for instance, say it just that plainly, but what happens with those laws is that you end up in situations like mine. So in that kind of, and in that kind of situation in the state that operates that way, there's this culture that's fostered that it's like, uh, domestic abuse don't matter. Um, our, you know, our gels are overran to begin with. We're losing money from all the, you know, so, so it's like, we're just going to hush this part up. Well, that is called oppression, friend. That's what that is. And so there's, there's no recourse for you. There's no safety for you. There's no security for you. That's what oppression is. And so when you get in a situation like that and you go file a protection order, well, what happened to mine is, the perpetrator of my abuse paid a lot of money to get rid of mine. And so they literally dissolved it, did not even permit me to sh- submit evidence. I had solid evidence that they could have prosecuted him with for aggravated assault of firearms, strangulation, among other things. Okay. Uh, lots of other felonies. And like you said, there's usually multiple. And, uh, and so I guess what I'm getting at is when you have, when you have something that is such a blatant prejudice that it exists in the legal framework, against a vulnerable group the culture that that uh fosters inside the criminal justice systems the family courts and the child protective services um you're not looking at getting half of the justice you're looking at getting your whole entire protection order dissolved for cash yeah. is what you're looking at because it's like oh well we can make money off this and we can keep him out of jail and that's gonna make the state make money uh, Most times we get no justice. Right, or exactly. Much less Correct. justice, you know? Yeah. I mean, we can't even yeah. have things put into place without a whole hot mess. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, aside from that, you know, ooh, a protection order. I mean, yeah, I have my ex yeah. recorded saying, go ahead, it's a piece of paper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. what's it really going to do? Yeah. Anyways, yeah. then yeah. you have, you know, all these places that, you know, there's problems, a lot of places, like you had mentioned earlier on the phone when we spoke about, you know, a lot of, a lot of them don't even get filed, you know? No, like, they don't. Just, they let it slide. And yes, it's a shame. These are people's lives that are being put into danger. Like, yeah. unless or until you are in a situation to where you literally have to be afraid for your life. Yes. You yes. don't get the right to tell anybody anything about yes. how that feels, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Like well, that's- and it's unfortunate. People don't people don't get it. And so what we've done in this country for a long time, it's like, okay, so I get this. What, what I'm about to say, I guess it could kind of go either way. And I would probably say the same thing to somebody, but I shouldn't have to. So like, all these rules they give you or, or like on a form from the protection order, like all these tips about when you walk into court, don't let your shoulders show. Why? Because automatically they're going to assume, oh, well, she's this. And then if you do let your shoulders show, 
then it's like, oh, well, now that makes me more deserving of what I went through. Then, so like, there's all these things that like your attorney will tell you to try to prevent you from someone feeling prejudiced against you as a domestic violence victim or a woman. Um, and you have to dress a certain way and speak a certain way and all these things. And it's like, I don't care. So this is the way I look at it. And, you know, people can say what they want to about it. I don't care if I was the trashiest, crackheadedest prostitute on the planet. And I walk into that court because somebody has committed aggravated assault with a firearm against me. I don't care if I'm wearing a bikini. I still have constitutional rights. I still have the right to live free of gender motivated violence. I still have the right to walk into a courtroom and get due process under the law. And so it's like, I guess what I'm getting at is when you take a person, a group or whatever, and you, and you make these um, ideas about what this person's supposed to look like, you know, that's the problem with gender biased policing is, you know, somebody calls the law and then they show up and say the girl's loud mouth and she's not crying. Well, that's not what a domestic violence victim should look like. Why? 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 She has on shorts to her butt. That's not what it, if she was really, no, quit making reasons. Like we why all have this a not, script that we follow when we're. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like we're supposed to walk around with our like face covered and stuff like that. And so I guess what I'm getting at is it's like whenever society does that and they put like a face and then, and now if you don't have this face, you don't belong in this group. And so then like you go in a cart room or, or even worse than that, if you do X, Y, or Z, well, then you were asking for it. Cause you know, and it's like, quit doing that. That's why we're still where we are. You know, mm-hmm. I don't, um, particularly, uh, I'm not somebody that, uh, dresses a certain way, but who cares if I was, I still have every right that someone who didn't, um, a drug addict still has constitutional rights. An alcoholic still has constitutional rights. Um, somebody who has been beaten to a pulp and their emotional stability is not okay has constitutional rights. Um, we need to quit putting a to have to experience anything, no. uh, regardless no. of what your situation is. And it happens. I think there's another big stigma that a lot of people are like, oh, well, it's, you know, like the more lower it's everybody, woman. it's all different kinds like, of, oh, it's probably both of them. She probably is just as mean as he, I, you know, things yeah. of that nature. And, and, you know, domestic violence happen. There are multimillionaires. I mean, yeah, it happens in every single social group and, yeah, and until we can open our eyes and admit that and acknowledge what's happening. It's never going to change. And well, and not just that, we have to start holding these people responsible who are creating a culture that permits this kind of crap to continue on. Because the thing about it is, is this, um, as we all well know, uh, the media, government, all these, whatever, they control narrative on everything. So, so, so what my point is, is this, what we talk about is what's important, right? Well, we don't talk about this kind of stuff. There's a stigma around it. And so what that does is it keeps us suppressed, keeps us suppressed. You don't talk about it. Then you have this happen to you unexpectedly. You don't talk about it. You don't talk about it until you're almost dead from it. And then you do come forward and then you're punished for coming forward. And then, and then you try and argue that your constitutional rights are being violated, but no one cares. <laughs> no one cares. But this is the thing that blows my mind. You know, all the things being said that you and I just said, no matter who you are, whatever, you have constitutional rights, et cetera. If a man that walked into a school and blew six kids' head off has constitutional rights and due process under the law and all of those things, then so should a victim. We make sure criminals' rights are protected, but we do not protect victims in this country. And that is a problem. And that's not just for domestic violence victims. I find that's just about unanimously around the board. Like, um, you know, victims are just, you know, I'll tell you, they're not as well off as criminals when it comes to their constitutional rights being protected. And that's a shame. It is. Oh, oh, well, time to move on. (laughs) Yeah. Just forget about it. Go to therapy. Like, no, like I want justice. I don't want to have to look over my shoulder where I, 
I walk out on my porch and have a cup of coffee because I'm afraid somebody's going to pop around the corner and strangle me to death. I shouldn't have to live like that. I shouldn't have to, you know, um, it's just mind blowing all of it. And imagine the difference that it would make in crime rates in general. Cause yeah. you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of these other crimes, you know, I mean, if, if somebody, you know, is, has an abusive nature in general, I mean, a lot of times there are other crimes that they commit as well. And I mean, especially when it comes to domestic violence, most abusers know there is zero accountability. So they have right. no reason to change. They have no reason to stop. They know nine times out of 10, they get away with it and they're not going to spend a single second in jail. So, yeah. you know, I mean, if we well, have, okay, so look at the 90, then yes. it would bring crime rates in general down if people yes. knew there was, they were going to be held accountable. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you this, another thing, this is, this will give you a good, a good feel for like the state of things. So what was it? The 90, was it 92 crime bill? Biden? I can't remember, but so basically that crime bill, um, put so many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in jail long term for, uh, petty drug offenses and stuff like that. And so my thing is this, if you can pick somebody up and you can book them, um, for a long time over a little bit of cocaine, then you can't book a person that has perpetrated felony crimes against the person, almost killed them, caused them uh, permanent damage in their body. Like we would rather mm -hmm. um, jail a man who had $20 worth of cocaine on him than a man that almost took another person's life. It makes zero sense. It does not make any sense. And that tells you that there's a whole lot backwards in this country um, that okay. needs to be dealt with. We have laws. And, and that's one of our biggest problems is some of this legislative, especially at a state level, because when you start talking about um, prosecuting, you know, everybody's like, OK, well, it's my you have the right. You have the First Amendment right to petition for redress, but you don't have a right to a remedy. OK, that's the thing. But this is the deal. When you petition for redress at the state level, your first step is you're walking into a sheriff's office, a police station, and you're saying, this crime is committed against me, okay? So, and I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but I'm pretty sure it is. I have a message from the district attorney and where I'm dealing with, and I asked him, why did you refuse charges against a man who committed aggravated assault with a fire? I have, a, I don't just have evidence. I have a self-admission on audio. Like, why did you not prosecute this man? And so I'm asking him these questions and he says, well, if the sheriff's office doesn't do a full investigation and or arrest, then I will not even consider prosecution. Okay. So then here's your one step. Now, your next step is after they do that, if they say, okay, this needs to be prosecuted, they turn it over to the district attorney's office. And then at that point, he decides whether he's going to pursue or refuse charges. So this is the deal. And this is one thing I'm going to be fighting hard for not just domestic violence victims, but every crime victim is this for judicial redress of grievance in a criminal courtroom. You're not starting by filing a petition in the court, which is your first amendment, right? You're starting at the sheriff's office. And when they refuse an investigation for you or refuse an arrest on a legitimate felony crime, or when the district attorney refuses charge, a charge on something that could be prosecuted and had sufficient evidence to prosecute, then they are acting as the gatekeeper to judicial redress in a state level. So all these Supreme Court acknowledgments state, well, you are afforded the right to petition, but you're not afforded the right to a remedy. Well, at a state level, unless there's a remedy, there is no petitioning for judicial redress, which is required to hold criminals accountable. Right. So that's unconstitutional all these uh the, so the backwards like everywhere you go there's roadblocks or yeah it is it's, it's it just, is and it's like how is your normal everyday person how are they supposed to navigate through this yeah to even yeah. be able to get effective how I, they give up they yeah. give up they give up and uh, a lot, like I said, too, like we, I've talked to you about a couple of times, it's like a lot of women going through stuff like this are also dealing with substance abuse issues. So you come out of a relationship, they're either, you know, some people are dealing with alcoholism, some people are dealing with drug abuse, um, you know, whatever it is. And then on top of that, you're completely broken emotionally. 
you need to heal there. So you need to heal emotionally, physically from uh, substance abuse if you have that issue. You have all these different things happening. And then you have a system that's pretty much set up to uh, re-victimize you. So at some point, it's unfortunate how many women who love their children and, and would be so much better for their children and whose children in their presence would completely heal them and they would be able to move on with life, lose Absolutely. their kids in this process and completely spiral and just give up. And I mean, how, do, how do you not? You know, yeah. and especially, especially when, you know, as a survivor and as somebody who knows that perpetrator inside and out knows fully yeah. what they are capable of. Yeah. And then you're expected as a parent whose role it is to protect yeah. and, and love and, you know, keep your children safe at all times. And you are literally forced into a position to where you have to put them in danger. Yes. And, or, and you have to sit back and watch this like do about it. Yeah. I've said so many times, it's like the state of Louisiana has sewed my eyes open and made me watch my daughter be destroyed. Like I am tied on a train track and they've sewed my eyes open. And my daughter is over there tied to the train track and there's a train coming. And I know like before that, before that train smashes me, it's, it's going to take my daughter out. And, but there's nothing I can do about it. I can fight. I can fight and I will never give up because they've messed with the wrong one. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a bad minute, but it was just a minute. I'm back. And so it's like, I will never quit fighting for my child, but that is exactly what it feels like. It's just like somebody has um, tied your hands and says, you know, oh, whatever happens, happens. Uh, you've got to watch it regardless. You can do all the right things. You can file all the right motions. You can become a whole lawyer and know all the laws. And it really won't matter, but it will matter because you'll get there. So don't give up. Um, we all, how we're going to get there is working together. You're not so, alone. <laughs> yes. And every person brings something to the table, something different network. Do not hide and hold. That's what you're going to want to do. Um, when you've been completely, uh, wounded and broken, um, you know, everybody wants to hide in a hole and lick their wounds because nobody wants to share that with people. But the truth is, when you do share that with other people, especially ones who have some of the same wounds that you do, um, you don't, you start healing and you start finding resources that are super important for you to get your heads back, for you to get your life back, for you to get back on track, for you to, you know, maybe you need housing, maybe you need whatever you need. Um, you know, networking with other people going through stuff helps you find the thing that you need. Um, hiding and drowning it away with substance is not going to make it better. Uh, it just makes it worse. So that's something else I'd like to say. It was such amazing time talking with you. And I really you look too, forward girl. to having you back on. So Absolutely. many things to talk about. It's I know so there is a lot. This is like, it's a really, it's such a big problem that you could unpack this for a year. <laughs> you know, oh, it's, sure. um, there's so many, so many layers to it, especially if you start talking about different states and the different issues, because everywhere is a little bit different, but overwhelmingly, yeah. I think they probably kind of deal with some, some of the same stuff, but I think well, it was good to see. We're going to get more into the aspects of the law, yeah. the law yeah. portion of it and, and maybe, you know, some remedies that might be able to help. Yeah. You know, yeah. Some of those victims out there that are, you know, going through the court sure. process and don't know what to do. So yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you that. We're not a scary professionals place. or lawyers. No, we're not. But, uh, no, we're not. Uh, but we have been through it and we are still going through it. it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so hopefully we'll be well, able to provide some sort of information that can help. Yeah. And hopefully we can, you know, bring more victims together to, start pushing forward and yeah everybody come together and, do the thing <laughs> sure. just do the thing yeah sure. well it was such a pleasure talking with yeah, you Vanessa, and we'll do it again soon sounds great thank you so much for having me all right thank you have a great day all right you too bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.